Hey everyone, this is Rick. Welcome back to the See the Startup Journey, a podcast sharing the origin stories of amazing entrepreneurs and their companies in episodes that are less than 20 minutes. Today, I'll be interviewing the co-founder of Caldi's Coffee, Suzanne Lenlua. Caldi's Coffee is a specialty coffee roasting company that's been around for more than 26 years. And Suzanne's story is quite amazing. So let's get right into it. Hey, Suzanne, uh, to start us off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself as well as the company that you started back in 1994, Caldi's Coffee? Sure. So my name is Suzanne Lingua, and I'm an alum of WashU. And I am by training a journalist, but I am by practice an entrepreneur and now a teacher as well. I started Caldi's in 1994 with my friend, Howard. We were both journalists at the time. We owned and operated the company for 15 years before selling it. And it's, it's currently still in operation. And you're a little bit different than the other founders that I've had on this podcast because many of them are only in their second or third year of running their business. But you ran your business from 1994, and I believe you sold it in 2007. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's 13 years. So how did Caldi's get started? And did you know that it was still be around even to this day, 26 years later? I certainly didn't know, but I'm delighted. Um, we got started like, you know, like so many other things in life, really by serendipity more than by design. I had a job as a reporter at the Riverfront Times, which I loved. And uh, my friend Howard was a reporter for the Business Journal. And that's how we knew each other through a journalism connection. He didn't love his job. He was kind of bored. I think boredom is a, a very big catalyst for entrepreneurs. He said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about taking a few years off of journalism and starting a business. And I, you know, I know him very well. And I said, that's a great idea. So we did some brainstorming together and we both pretty much knew fairly quickly what was really needed in St. Louis at the time was a, a place to, to convene that wasn't your home or your office or a, a bar. Mm -hmm. And people got together at coffee houses, but St. Louis had no coffee house culture, which was kind of bizarre because at the time, Starbucks were in, you know, all over America, but St. Louis didn't even have a Starbucks at the airport. So we knew that there would be um, a marketplace demand, but most importantly, we wanted a, a, a place where people could, could kind of grow a sense of community. We, we kind of knew the location and we, we settled on the idea of a coffee house. We had no money. We entirely bootstrapped the whole thing. We, 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 I think, really benefited from the fact that we were journalists because you wake up every day as a journalist and you have to quickly ask a lot of questions about a subject that you probably know nothing about right. and then synthesize the information and write a story. And that's sort of how we approached um, the coffee house business. We didn't have experience in the restaurant mm -hmm. industry at all. And we didn't really know about coffee. We talked to a guy who had a very tiny, tiny little window like a, it was a, a window a coffee house window there so we talked to him because we loved his coffee and he said you know i get this micro roasted coffee from a roaster in kansas city so we drove to the roaster in kansas city and we said you know we're opening a coffee house and we can't there's no good small batch roasted coffee in st louis we'd like to buy your coffee and uh we that's how we found our the company that was would then start roasting our coffee we found this space at the corner of two dead end streets that nobody else wanted this is kind of weird. We knew a guy who had a bulldozer and he basically bought buildings, bulldozed them himself and tried to sell all the stuff in the building. And then he would build parking lots. Mm -hmm. We just happened to know him. He was a source <laughs> for both of us. So we knew we needed tables and chairs and this mm -hmm. guy's name was Larry. So we called up Larry and he said, oh yeah, I've got five buildings. I'm going to bulldoze tons of tables and chairs. Come and get them. So we, wow. you know, we got these old tables and chairs and we put them together and we painted them and we covered them ourselves. And we kind of scrapped together the entire space. We opened up and, you know, it was, it, we had no idea the, the pent up demand that there was for people to leave their houses and their offices and hang out in a coffee house. And so it, it was, it really exceeded our expectations. We were crushed with people coming in the door every day. And so I quickly realized as much as I love, you know, being a journalist, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to really right. jump. And so I, uh, I kissed my journalism job goodbye, sadly, and just de delved into the coffee house business with Howard. And within about six or seven months, the roaster in Kansas city, who we were using said, 
you guys need to roast your own coffee. You're do, you, your volume is so high. So this, this, this man was so nice. His name was Jim. He said, I'll teach you how to roast your own coffee. First of all, there was like, there was barely the internet, right? Nobody was right. Googling stuff right and left. Mm-hmm. So out of the goodness of his heart, this guy taught us how to roast on this old, wow. you know, German probot roaster. And then we bought a roaster, never thinking that we would get into the wholesale business. Uh-huh. I mean, we were, we were, it was a very organic build. You know, we were roasting coffee for our own shop. And within a few weeks, other places like small grocery stores, Straubs, um, and restaurants came to us and said, yeah. we want your coffee in our restaurants and in uh-huh. our grocery store. So that's sort of the evolution of our, of our beginnings. Wow. <laughs> I love that story. And I mean, like most of us know that the majority of the startups would fail. So what do you think is the reason behind why Caldi survived and thrived to this day? I think the biggest reason is that we self-funded for, you know, for 15 years. We, we were very debt averse. A lot of businesses fail because they get highly leveraged and then they can't service their debt. We, we didn't qualify for loans. We couldn't get loans. I got hit by a Salvation Army truck and it, on the highway. It crushed my car. And the Salvation Army's car insurance wrote me a check for $13,000 because they totaled my car. Okay. Um, and that was our, that was our seed, the biggest chunk of our seed money from that car, <laughs> car settlement. It happened, you know, very, like about a month before we opened and we were like, great, you know, I'm not going to buy another car. We're going to, you know, buy more fixtures. Our debt was, our leverage was very, very, very limited. So I think that helped. We had very, very measured growth. And I think that that, that, that kept us able to build the business and build the brand in the most vulnerable first few years. Mm-hmm. Did you eventually buy a new car? Eventually I bought a new car because I needed <laughs> to deliver coffee. We, we- right. And like Caldi's, you can find them on Washu campus as well as in supermarkets like Schnucks. So like, how did you first go about approaching these huge businesses, especially when perhaps you might not have a track record before? It's true. We did not have a track record and we approached them with great humility. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, approaching a place like Washington University that has a lot of locations and a lot of volume is very intimidating (laughs) Um, because number one, they might just say no, you know, they might just Mm -hmm. not even meet with you because they have, you know, a place like WashU has a lot to answer to. They, it's not okay for them to just say, you know, today the coffee wasn't delivered, so we can't brew coffee at, you know, Cafe mm-hmm. Bergson or Whispers or wherever, you know, you they you got to be there and you have to give them the assurance that you can handle their volume. And we didn't have models and other customers that we could show Wash U to say, you know, we handled all the volume here. We had ourselves and our, our, our faith and our abilities and an open mind mm-hmm. and the humility to say, you know, what are your needs and give us a little bit of time to figure out how to meet them. Mm-hmm. And a place like Washu, it was so wonderful to work with them because they worked with us, you know, and they made us a better roaster. They came to us and they said, you know, we want fair trade organic coffee. Mm-hmm. And we were like, great, we have one fair trade organic coffee. We had a wonderful Guatemalan at the time. So it, it helped us kind of get our supply chain more ethical and sustainable. So they made us a better roaster and, and they, you know, they would be patient with us. We'd say, you know, we've never, um, I remember when we were installing the brewers at Whispers, we'd never installed brewers that large before in right. our life. Cause when you're in the co- a wholesale business, you're not just in the coffee business, you're in the equipment business because you loan these customers right. that equipment. So, um, you know, we said we need a good two or three days to just calibrate these brewers and make sure they're, they're brewing good coffee and, and they were good. You know, they were fine with that. They wanted us to, to sample the coffee to students and get student feedback and use that in our offering. We were fine with that too. So, mm-hmm. you know, they asked of us and we asked of them and it turned out really well. You know, when same with Schnucks, we had never, we didn't even have a piece of bagging equipment that, you know, could bag the, the coffee in that kind of volume. So mm-hmm. we wanted to start small with them and they let us do that. And within a few months they say, okay, no more small stuff. January of next year, we want you, instead of in five stores, we want you in 50 stores. You know, here's a heads up, see what you can do. And so, you know, we were able to buy a bigger packaging machine. So 
when you, I think when you approach something that seems daunting with a lot of humility and asking a lot of questions, um, your, your customers, they rally for you. You know, they give you the grace that you're asking for. So anyway, that's a long answer, but that's how we did it. <laughs> no, I love that. And the packaging looks great as well. So there must have been a lot of challenging moments for you during the years that you ran the company. So if you look back right now, what would you say was the most challenging moment for you? One moment really comes to mind that was, I, it was super challenging. We had a partner. Um, he didn't own any of our business, but he was like an industry partner. Like I said, when you, in, in the wholesale business, it's not enough to just supply coffee. You have to supply the coffee brewing equipment and that, that equipment you pay for, you maintain, um, but it's sitting in the restaurants that you service, mm -hmm. but it's your equipment. So if it breaks, you have to fix it or replace right. it. So it's a huge amount of investment in these coffee mm -hmm. brewers. And that's a totally different business, you know, maintaining coffee brewing equipment. So we met a man named Kurt and he said, I want to take this company in a different direction. I'd love to specialize in coffee brewing equipment in restaurants. And if I maintain, owned and maintained the equipment and you supplied the coffee, that could be a really good partnership. And then, you know, we split the profit. And it was great because he had all these technicians that really understood machinery. Mm -hmm. We understood coffee. And so we would jointly be able to assure customers, you're gonna have the best equipment support, the best equipment um, and the best coffee. So our, co our competitor, we had a very large competitor, a long established coffee company in St. Louis called Renoco. We had, we, we didn't know this, but we'd gotten their attention. They didn't like that we were pulling, not just pulling business away from them. We were pulling the high profile places. They, they approached our partner and they said, if, if you switch and you supply them Renoco coffee instead of Caldi's, we'll, we'll give you some money. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it, we'll give you a better deal. Uh -huh. And he did without telling us one day. Wow. He just, he just bolted away from us and he, over, over a little bit of extra money, he partnered with this, with Renoco. So I got a call on a Wednesday morning from Bill Cardwell, who has a restaurant in West County. And he said, somebody just came, you know, your delivery guy just came and instead of putting Caldi's coffee in my grinders, they put this, you know, blankety blank Renoco coffee in what's going on. And I said, oh my gosh, I don't know. So I called Kurt and Kurt said, I'm sorry. You know, I've got kids to feed. I got a better deal with Renoco to distribute their coffee in my, you know, for use in my brewers. Mm -hmm. And every single one of our customers was, you know, suddenly a Renoco customer. And so my partner Howard and I were like, what are we going to do? Right. We knew what we had to do. We had to do two things. We had to contact all of our customers, explain the situation and say, you know, your, whatever coffee you use is up to you, but we're here for you. We will re replace your brewers on our dime with our own brewers. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get you new brewers if you consider, you know, staying with us. And, we'll, you know, we'll give you the service that you have always come to expect with us. So we visited every customer in two days. Wow. Every, we didn't sleep. We visited every single customer. We talked to the owners and the chefs. We explained the situation. Um, we assured them that we would replace their brewers that, and we would own, we would never again use uh, a partner to own that equipment. We would own it so that this would never happen again. No disruption of your service. We didn't lose a single customer. That was the second thing we had to do is we had to go to our bank and say, hey, remember us? Now we really would <laughs> like a little bit of, of, of credit because we need to buy, you know, close to 300 pieces of coffee brewing equipment that week. We went out to St. Charles where there was a coffee equipment manufacturer and we explained the situation and we said, we need to buy equipment with these specs fast. They worked overtime to build us this equipment. So it was, it was a stressful month. It was a really mm -hmm. stressful month, but we came out a stronger company for it because we realized don't out, don't ever outsource a core competency and coffee brewing equipment. We realized had to be a core competency. So, you know, we, we learned more about equipment. We always, from then on, always owned our own equipment and our own distribution. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that was challenging. You sound so passionate about it. And, you know, why, what made you decide to sell the company back in 2007? It's funny because we weren't, it, it was, Rick, it was the weird situation. We weren't for sale. You know, we never, uh -huh. we weren't looking to sell the company at all. Right. You realize you do have to grow to thrive. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of people working for us and we, we were able to um, give them good careers in coffee and, 
And when you're responsible for people's futures, you realize you need to grow to help your own, your own people um, grow as individuals in their careers too. But we had a wholesale customer who um, had a lot of, uh, he was a franchiser and he had a lot of sandwich shops. And he said to us, you know, he, so he was a franchisee of this sandwich company. And he said, I don't like my franchisor. I'd like to put Caldi's in these, these, these places. And we said, oh, you know, we're, we, we never want to franchise franchises in our model. And he said, okay, well, you know, think about it. Mm-hmm. He was a smart man. And we didn't really think about it at all. <laughs> he came back to us and he said, have you thought about it? We said, no, you know, we're not interested in, in franchising. And he said, okay, I understand that. What if we went into partnership? And I, these, play, these, these leases that I have, instead of putting in my franchise concept, I'll get rid of my franchise rights. And I put in call these, but you don't have to deal with it. I'll take on all that risk. So we tried it with a few stores um, in Kirkwood and in Chesterfield, and it worked out well. Over the course of like two years, he asked us, you know, I, I would be interested in buying the whole company from you, not just having these partnerships and new stores, but buying your whole company. And we're, we would always say, you know, it's just not anything that we've thought about. It's, you know, right. and again, being very smart, and he was a good negotiator. He just, he would just come back with, offers to us that, you know, we're increasingly over time, these offers started looking like we would be really dumb not to take them. You know, would be mm-hmm. like, who would walk away from something like that? He had also, because we were in business with him a little bit in this kind of like minor partnership, we were able to realize that he cared his family. It's not just him, it's his family. They care about the brand, but most importantly, they care about our staff and our customers. They, they really they care about that sense of community, which is really why we got into the business. They, they care mm-hmm. about people. So that anyway, mm-hmm. that's why we sold. Gotcha. So you are a lecturer. You're teaching entrepreneurship at WashU right now. And so for my last question, I want to ask, what advice do you have for someone like me who is still a student, but I'm interested in entrepreneurship and wants to potentially start something of my own in the future? So my best advice to you is to keep an open mind. Don't think that studying business is going to be the best way to do business. Have an open mind about trying things. You, I, I've seen a lot of people sketch out ideal businesses on paper. You know, they look really good. They're very, they, they've done a lot of really good analysis. But then when they open their business, you know, stuff isn't going well. And I think a better approach towards business is do your analysis, do, you know, do some analysis, don't go in blind, but, you know, try on a small scale. I mean, some of the, some of the neatest restaurants started out in somebody's kitchen as a caterer or, you know, with a small investment in a food truck and, and you can do little beta test markets really well now more than ever. I mean, a lot of people do, do you know, like a micro business, a sole entrepreneurship type micro business through Instagram. And you get so much real-time market data. It, it's just try stuff. Just try stuff, and don't mm-hmm. don't let the don't let your ideal perfect business be the enemy of a good enough business. Because good enough businesses, once you get feedback and iterate, they they go they they start getting into the realm of a kind of an ideal business. So try things. Keep an open mind, um, and get to know a lot of people. In, in, in outside of the business world, because they're the ones mm-hmm. that will really, um, I think, help you the most to understand w- w- what are people looking for? Where are their opportunities? You know, how can mm-hmm. you really effectuate change? Right. And it, it often doesn't happen in, in the ways that we would expect. Got it. Well, that's it for today's interview. Thank you, Suzanne, for taking the time to do this. Thank um, you. And yeah, I wish you the best of luck and stay safe as well. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to see our takeaways from this interview, as well as the latest previews and highlights for our future episodes, make sure you follow us on Instagram. You can also find our episodes on Apple or Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. As always, if there is any question you would like to see asked during our interviews, or if there's a particular industry or company you would like to see, leave a comment below. Finally, make sure you subscribe and share this podcast with your friends so that we can grow our seed of innovation and creativity together. With that, I'll see you next time.